I got to finish it. So we're talking about feed forward control. So I'm going to go through this quickly. Remember the basic idea here is that instead of doing typical feedback control where we measure the thing we want to control, compare it to the set point and manipulate the input accordingly. In this case, we're going to do something different. We're going to measure the disturbance here directly, operate on that with some feed forward controller, and then we're going to generate a signal. So the idea of this approach is obviously you don't compensate for the disturbance until you see the output changing from the set point. And at that point, it takes usually a fair amount of time to get it back to set point because our time constants of our typical processes are minutes and sometimes even hours. In this case, the idea is that we can anticipate a disturbance affecting the output. Perhaps we can cancel its effect before it even has an effect or cancel most of its effect. Okay? So I went through some examples. Um, the main, um, well, maybe I'll just go through one of these examples to give you some idea. So this was the idea of, um, so we have here is we're creating steam for downstream operations, maybe heat exchangers. So we have a steam generation unit here. Uh, we want to control the level of this unit. So a, a logical thing is measure the level and then put more water into the boiler when uh, the level changes or drops or increases. And the reason it would do that is because there's a different changes in the steam demand because this might be used by many, many exchangers. So the steam demand will go up and down. So rather than do this and let the level vary quite a bit, you might consider doing this. Just measure the steam demand directly and then adjust the flow to try to balance the demand. Okay? So in this case, you should get a lot less variations in the level than you would with this approach. All right, and then you can put the two together. Fine. Okay, we talked about <laughs> ratio control. I don't really want to talk about that again. Um, we talked about how to design controllers based on steady state models, which is unusual because when we talked about feedback control, we never talked about steady state models, but it's not uncommon in, in um, when we do feed forward control to use a steady state instead of a dynamic model. The, mo the reasoning for that is because the feedback controller will take care of all the dynamics, so the feed forward controller can be just on based on steady state considerations. So I went through a couple of examples here. This one was a column. This was a blending system to show you how you just do steady state mass balances, then you can convert that into a simple feed forward control law. Came here. This is our general block diagram for feed forward control system. It doesn't look any different than what we've seen before with the exception of this loop up here, right? So now the disturbance is going to be measured. We're going to operate that on that with a feed forward controller. And this picture is feedback and feed forward together. So the, imp the signal being sent to the control valve will be the sum of the output coming from the feedback controller and the feed forward controller. And we would design this feedback controller like we always do. IMC, you know, Cohen Kuhn, Ziegler Nichols, direct synthesis, whatever. So really, the question here is how do we go about designing this controller? I drive this um, closed loop transfer function for the system. It should look pretty familiar with the exception of this. So if you eliminate this term up here, that's the standard closed loop transfer function between the output and the disturbance. And so this new term comes because of this path that exists between the disturbance and the output. So the numerator, recall, is the, is the path, or paths in this case, between the disturbance and the output. There's one path, just GD. And then we add the other path, with this, which is this way. It goes through all four of those transfer functions. That's where we got this thing. Okay. And then we said, um, well, a couple of things. One nice thing is that if we look at the characteristic equation of this closed loop system, we see it's this. It hasn't changed at all by the introduction of this feed forward controller. So this feed forward controller has no effect on stability. So you can design, it may badly affect performance, <laughs> but it won't badly affect um, stability. And that's because it's not in the feedback loop, right? Stability is just determined by the things in the feedback loop, and this thing's not in the feedback loop. Then I pose this question. It took a while to get the answer from you, but you finally got it. I asked you, what would you really want this transfer function to be? So this is the transfer function between the output and its disturbance here. And we decided, uh, ideally, that'd be zero, because that says disturbance changes has no effect on the output at all. That'd be ideal. Okay? And can we do that? Well, you can do that if you set this numerator equal to zero. And can you do that? Well, you can. Because you could, in, in principle, solve for this feed forward controller. That's what we're trying to design. Everything else here is specified. We're trying to design this feed forward controller. So if you take this equation, numerator, set it equal to zero, solve for GF, you get that equation. Okay, that's called the ideal feed forward controller. All right, and then the last thing I did, as I recall, is I told you sometimes you can implement this thing and sometimes you can't. Okay, and we went through a couple of examples. Um, of when you can, well, actually only one example when you can, and a couple where you might have problems. The idea of this example was you got something that looked like this, and this is called a lead lag unit. So it's this term in the numerator first order is called the lead, and this thing in the denominator is called the lag. It's just 
frequency response terminology, which we don't cover. Um, and this is the gain of the feed-forward controller involves the gain of all <coughs> these other things. So this becomes the kind of standard form for a, for a feed-forward controller. So if someone asks you, I have a feedback controller, what will I choose it to be? Your normal answer would be PID, okay? Because that's the most common thing to do if you don't know anything else. If someone said, I want to design a feed-forward controller, what should I do? The, the answer is design a lead lag, okay? A lead lag means, well, I'll cover this in a moment, but you need to know the gain of the lead lag and the, these two time constants. We'll talk about that. All right, then I came up with a couple of problems. The problems were if this thing was not implementable when we used this equation right here. And so one was if there was a time delay in the process, then this would involve prediction, okay? Because this is in the denominator, and therefore you get the e to the plus theta s in the numerator. That means prediction. That means to implement this thing, <coughs> you have to know what the disturbance is going to be in the future, which you don't know, right? So if this time delay is substantial, that's going to be a problem. If it's small, you might just say, I'll just use the current value of the disturbance, which is equivalent to just getting rid of that. But this is not causal, so this is not directly implementable. And then, if you had a higher order process transfer function, you would get some, like for this example, you get something that looks like this. This is probably not desirable, because if you look at the order of this thing, it's order two in the numerator and order one in the de um, denominator. And if you took this back in the time domain, which we're not gonna do, but if you did, you'd see this requires to take the derivative of the disturbance. And typically, we don't like derivatives. Yeah? Um, can you mention again what makes a controller like implementable or not implementable necessarily? Like the IMC controller design was not implementable until you converted it back to a like regular... Oh, those are two different things. They are two different kinds of <laughs> yeah. implementable. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what, when I talked about IMC, I said you can design the controller that GC star, right? This is the IMC controller. And, and the argument I made there is that it's, it's easier to design this thing than the regular controller, the GC, but it's not the way you usually implement it, although you could if you wanted to, but you typically don't. So typically you convert this to the regular controller and implement that. But you could implement this with that whole IMC block diagram. You can do that if you want. Okay. That's to be contrasted with this. This is not physically implementable. It's not pop. Right. At least I don't. Okay. It. And, you know, I call this not implementable in the sense that I don't want to implement it because I don't want something takes the derivative of the disturbance, but, you know, in principle you could approximate the derivative like a PID controller. It's, you can do it, but you don't really want to. But all their block diagrams would look the same as the one on the last page? Yeah, they all look like this. Okay. Yeah, and we're, just ar we're just not arguing. I'm not sure why I use that term. Um, Freudian slip, perhaps. Uh, we're just... De um, determining what's actually living in this block. So depending on what the, the different transfer functions are, you get different feed-forward controllers, and my argument is some of them are implementable and some are not. Okay. <coughs> All right. So this is where we left off. So this is, the, this is the, the, where we quit last time. So what I'm talking about now is kind of generic feed-forward controller, and my argument here is that our generic form of the feed-forward controller is going to be this thing. It's the analogy of like a PID controller for feedback control. You'd say, well, wh where in the world did you come up with this? Well, you should have asked me where in the world I come up with PID control, right? Because I just pulled that out of a hat as well. But the mo motivation for using something like this is you can see that if you have, sorry, I'm going back and forth, I know you hate that. If you have this case here, right, where each one's first order, then you actually get exactly that kind of lead lag controller. So the idea is that if you don't know any better, right, then you're going to start with this anyway, just like starting with PID or something like that, okay? Um, I'm not sure why I felt motivated to repeat this example, but I did. So it's the same as the first example on the previous page. You take all these transfer functions, put them into the formula I gave, you actually get a lead lag controller, and the gain of this thing is just this thing in the front here, so it's that. So in other words, you can calculate the gain of this, by knowing the gains of the disturbance transfer function, the transmitter that measures the disturbance, the valve, the process, and so on, okay? All right, just, so this just gives you some idea how, about, how you go about tuning this. So if someone said, I want to build a feed-forward controller, okay, then I'd specify, well, you should, you should do this. And they'd say, well, what's the gain? I'd say, well, if you know all these gains, I would try the, I would use this gain. I would calculate the gain as being this. You understand? This is general. This is true only for these transfer functions, but I'm going to use this anyway. 
for any transfer function. So I'm just going to use it blindly, if you will. So, so that means I need to know, in order to tune this feed forward controller, I need to know that gain in these two time constants. So the way I'm going to calculate the gain is knowing the gains of all the other things that I just, just mentioned, right? This would be the gain of the disturbance, so on and so forth. So I would calculate that. What would I use for tau 1? Well, so this says tau p, so that's the time constant of the process if it's first order. But if it's not first order, I would use the dominant time constant. You remember what the dominant time constant of the process is? So if you have a g of s, so let's say it looks like this, just for the sake of argument. But this thing's second order. It has two time constants. One of them's 10, one of them's 2. The dominant time constant is the larger one, 10. Okay? So in other words, if you know the dominant time constant, which means essentially the characteristic response time of your system, then I would use that value for the tau 1. Okay? And then I would do the same thing, dominant time constant with the disturbance, to pick the tau 2. Okay? And all this says is, okay, those will give you initial values right, for the gain and the two time constants in this feed forward controller, and then you could fine tune and move them around like a PID control to get better performance if you want. Right, so if you had a disturbance here, so here's your output, let's say there's your set point, and then there's a disturbance, and with your, your feed forward controller does that, the tendency would think, well maybe that's a little too conservative, too slow, looks kind of slow, so maybe I would decide that KF value is not quite large enough, I should increase it. You know. So in other words, I have to do some fine tuning and then maybe I'd get something that looks like that. And then I'd be satisfied with that. So this just is a way to get initial values for these controllers. We don't do a lot of tuning of feed forward controllers. It's one slide versus, remember PID, we spent like two lectures. So that gives you some idea <laughs> of the relative um, importance, at least in my own mind. All right. So this just is different ways to implement feedback and feed forward control. This is the way I've already talked about and I already showed you this picture. So this was the boiler example. So what did we have? We had a feed forward controller that tried to measure the steam <laughs> demand and adjust the flow rate of, of water to this boiler based on measurement of the demand. So in other words, if this demand goes up, put more water in the boiler because the level will be dropping soon. Okay. Um, the problem with this approach is that um, you know these feed forward controllers will compensate for the disturbance, but they usually don't compensate for them perfectly because they might be based on a steady state model or the model may not be perfect or um, so a variety of things might happen. So usually combine that with a feed forward controller. So the job, of the f sorry feedback, the feed forward controller job is just to try to mitigate the effect of this disturbance as much as possible. Maybe not perfectly, maybe not even dynamically. And then the feedback <laughs> controller will fix everything else in principle. So whatever this controller doesn't do in terms of keeping the level constant, this controller will. Okay, so this just, whoops, sorry. Standard feedback, feedback controller, right? Measure level, operate on with controller, compare it to the set point, send signal to valve. Okay, no, no big deal. Um, this is a slightly different configuration, probably a little more um, confusing, especially since we haven't talked about cascade control yet, but the idea here is that Obviously, this is a different system. It's not the same as a mixing system. Right? We have two streams. We're going to mix them together. And the idea here would be we'd want to pick the flow rate of this stream so we get the composition coming out of this mixing tank that we would like. All right? So what this says is that you're going to, so what are you going to do? Well, you need a feedback controller. You're going to measure the composition, send that to a um, controller, compare it to the set point. And now instead of sending that signal right there directly to this valve, which is what you would normally do, you send, you, this becomes a set point for this controller. So this is a feed forward controller. So what's the idea of the feed forward controller? Well, you anticipate that the composition of this stream might change, right? To do feed forward control, you have to determine what you think is going to go wrong. In this case, you say, well, this might vary a lot. So I I'm going to measure it, and then I'm going to design a feed forward controller that adjusts the flow of this to try to compensate for it, okay? So there's your feed forward controller there's your feedback controller, but instead of them adding together like here and sending the signal to the valve, you actually have this one provide a set point to the other one. Okay, so this should be confusing to you <laughs> because we haven't really talked about cascade control, but we will. Okay, so just, you can just store this in your mind if you like. Oh, we have a Simulink example. This is exciting. I haven't done that for a while. All right. So what I'm going to do is show you how to implement a feedforward controller in MATLAB or Simulink, let's say. So it's just similar to what you've done before, except um, 
kids. All right. Um, so my son lost his calculator because he said, I need a scientific calculator. You know, I'm like, I'm not so sure. But okay, fine. Go get it for him. Um, then he leaves it on the counter for like three weeks. And then he needs it last night. He's got, I lost my calculator. You know? <laughs> and so he just sent me an message that said, you need to find my calculator. Maybe I should text him back and say, should I leave class right now, or would it be okay if I leave after class? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, what I'm doing here is just a kind of a toy example. So I'm, I'm giving you that this is the process transfer function, okay? So process just first order gain three time constant five. I do an IMC design. I don't give you the details, but I'm telling you I'm going to take a closed loop time constant of 2.5. That's one half the open loop time constant, which is pretty standard. And if you go through the whole IMC design, right, this first order filter with this time constant, you get a PI controller that looks like that. Y we already know how to do that, so I'm not really focusing on that. All right. And now I'm saying I'm going to specify the disturbance transfer function to be this, so it's also a first order gain one. Um, Gain one, time constant one. And now I'm going to use this, this probably needs a little bit of explanation. So I'm I have this formula I'm using. It looks a little bit different than the formula I showed you in the past, which is that formula, okay? So the idea is usual. What I've done here, I've made this argument a lot, and most of the homework examples and test problems assume this, right? Is I can't differentiate the transmitter from the valve to the process, so I just lump those all things all together. Okay, so if I lump those all together, and I guess I called it GP, sometimes I call that lump thing G, but in this case I called it GP, so now the whole denominator just becomes GP. It includes the valve and the measurement device in there, okay, which are usually have no appreciable dynamics anyway. Um, so I use this formula, there's the GP, there's the GD, plug them in, you get this thing. It's a lead lag. There's the tau 1, there's the tau 2, and that, that thing in the front is the KF, okay. Now I'm going to implement this in Simulink. And I'll show you this in a minute, but it looks like this. So, th so this hopefully looks roughly familiar, modulo this part up here, right, which is new. So what do we have? Well, we put in a transfer function that represents the process, right? We add the disturbance going through its transfer function. This is like U through GP and D through GD. They add together to form the output. Measure the output, compare it to a set point that generates an error signal send that to a PID controller, namely that thing right there. Um, and then that signal eventually goes and affects the process, right? So the new thing, there's nothing new about that. Zero, okay? The new part is we have this feed forward controller. So now what we're going to do is take the disturbance, measure it, right? We don't explicitly show the measurement, but, so, and we're going to take the disturbance, we're going to operate on it with the feed forward controller, which I've written like this, which is just, the same as that, except I've multiplied through by 3 and minus 1, same thing, okay? And then that thing is going to be added to the output of the feedback controller, and that's the signal that actually goes in the process. So the, the signal we send to the process is the sum of the feed forward controller output and the feedback controller output, okay? All right, and this is my proposition, that if there's a disturbance, namely this disturbance changes, th th it'll be much better with feed forward control than without it. Okay? It won't help at all if you change this set point or something else goes wrong, right? But it, it should compensate v very nicely for the disturbance. In fact, based on the theory I presented to you, it should compensate perfectly because this should make the disturbance have no effect. All right. So I guess I could open this up in MATLAB. Um, not really sure what the point would be, though. <laughs> Can you just trust me since we're a little behind? and you guys have a flooded crib, that um, I perform, I did, th I did this. If you want to, I posted all these examples online, and I think they're all in a big zip file. So if you unzip this, you'll find this example. If you open up, you'll see it looks exactly like this. And nothing in this block diagram is novel. They're all transfer functions, you know, add or subtract, PID control, write to the workspace, specify a set point, nothing's new. All right, so if you'll let me just proceed along those lines. Okay. So, um, aren't I supposed to be comparing? I guess I decide, I don't need, this one's not particularly germane. I'm not sure why I put it first, but um, let's just do this one first. Okay, so what did I do to do this simulation? 
So I did two, I actually simulated two things. I directly simulated this, this system here. I did a step change in the disturbance, like a you know, what, uh, unit step change in the disturbance to see what the effect would be. And I think that step change you can see here was done at time five, just because that's what I felt like doing. Okay, <laughs> so right, it runs at steady state, um, which of course deviation variables mean zero. Disturbance occurs at, f at time equal five. Um, I implemented both the feed forward feedback, which is what I showed you, and just a feedback controller, which I'll explain in a minute. Okay. And you can see if you just have the feedback controller, there's a big perturbation, right? Because you don't know the disturbance is coming because you're not using the measurement. And therefore, the output gets pushed far away from the set point, well, pretty far away, and takes quite some time to bring it back. While the feedback feed forward controller, perfect, right? Didn't have any effect at all. That's what the theory says. It's not liable to be this way in practice, right? Because your model of disturbance is not perfect in all this. But for this <laughs> idealized case, it is. No effect at all. And this just shows you the corresponding inputs. So you can see the feed, this feedback, feed forward combination thing. And, and in this case, you actually don't even need feedback control because the feed forward controller does everything because it's pretty idealized. You can see it generates a much bigger signal to compensate for the fact this disturbance has occurred than the feedback, so it responds much quicker. Okay. So the way I did this feedback control, just for your edification, is I just s temporarily set this thing equal to zero, right? So to do that particular simulation, I just went into this thing and, and set, set the numerator equal to zero. So in other words, it doesn't do anything. Don't set the denominator equal to zero. I won't like that, okay? So I just temporarily set these, the numerator polynomial to have all zeros, and then this is just a zero transfer function does nothing, which means you have no feed forward control. Okay, which means the only thing that does anything is the feedback controller. And that's how I generated this particular, the blue line there. Okay. Um, and then even though it's not that clear here, what this is showing is that if you do a set point change, so again at time equal five, not a disturbance, but you change the set point from zero to one, um, the controllers are identical. It, you can't, it, somehow, for some reason I didn't show, there's two things plotted here. but. Um, there's no difference whatsoever for a set point change, okay? They do exactly the same thing. So the, the idea behind this is that this, is, this additional complexity here buys you a lot if that disturbance changes, but it doesn't do anything if the set point changes or any other disturbance changes. You realize in a real plant, there's lots of disturbances. So you're only gonna put in this kind of effort for a disturbance that you know what it is and it's very problematic. Like it happens all the time, okay? All right. Good. So that takes care of that. Now, hate to keep bringing this up, but what are you guys supposed to do when, while you don't have the crib? Just like wander around the, the campus looking for places to work? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, do you guys use the computers down there? Most of you have your own computers, right? So that's not a big deal. How do you run Aspen? Do you, ru you run that over the network? Yeah, we don't. Yeah. Use the computers down there? Yep. Yeah. Because the, it used to be that you could run it over the network, but that was so useless because the network is so slow that it didn't work. So now, so now you guys, if you want to run Aspen like for your design project, you're expect you need to use the computers down there, and now they're not available. Yep. Yep. Sounds less than ideal. Yep. Just think about it. It sounds like two of your courses are about to end. Design and lab. So. <laughs> Yeah? They have a flash drive that's been that we can use to install Aspen. Those also Those aren't available either. Yeah, they're in the laptop flooded off the Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be Amity's office? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what to tell you. Just I'm glad I'm not department head. I'll tell you that much. Okay. I should quit bringing up the crib. It just distracts you guys. Okay, no more. <laughs> No more crib references at all. All right, so now we're going to talk about something completely different, um, which is, you know, there's not a lot of theory in this lecture, which you may enjoy more than some of the other ones, but it's just introduced the idea that in many industries, the primary, primary way you do manufacturing is in batch, not continuous, and everything we've talked about is pretty much continuous, right? Steady states. You know, steady states only exist for continuous process, they only exist for batch. So, I'm just trying, in this lecture, I'm just trying to give you an overview of batch processing and batch control so that you have some idea of what it is, okay? Uh, 
So I'll introduce the idea. I'll talk about this logic. So when you run batch operations, they pretty much consist of just running different steps at t in a time sequence. Open this valve, open this valve, dump some stuff in, heat it up, take it out, shut it down. Okay, so it's all sequential. And that's what this refers to. Um, you can also do control during the batch. So for example, if you're doing some manufacturing that involves temperature, you might actually want to temp control temperature during the batch itself, which I'll talk about. Run to run control, I don't talk about much, but that's the idea that it's very common in a lot of these batch manufacturing processes that you don't have any measurements available until the batch is run. So let's say you're making a polymer in a batch. So you have no measurement of the product quality, which means like molecular weight, until the batch is already run. Then you take it to the lab and you measure the molecular weight. What happens if you don't like it? Well, the first thing is you got a bad batch, okay? I'll tell you what you do with a bad batch in a second. But what you want to do then is, is change what you do next time you do run a batch, right? So that's called run-to-run -run control. Use information from the last batch to improve the next one. If you get off-spec material, um, there's three things you can do. Part of this is a joke, so you can figure out which part's a joke. The f first thing you do is mix it with good material so that it's on spec. That's pretty common. Um, uh, uh, the other thing you can do is just trash it, throw it away, burn it. <coughs> the other thing you can do is sell, sell it to another country where they, they don't, <laughs> okay, that is the joke part, um, where they don't, they don't have maybe tight of specifications for their products, let's say. All right. And then at the end, I'll talk about the whole batch production management, um, which is a whole uh, subject in and of itself, but I'll at least mention it to you. All right. So these are just a bunch of little comments about batch manufacturing, but so obviously you don't make commodity chemicals in batches. So you never see a batch ethylene plant, right? That doesn't make any sense. But for specialty chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and materials processing, it's almost always batch. Okay? And even in a lot of, um, you know, like alternative fuels, you know, they have all these alternative fuel companies trying to make um, liquid fuels and things. Those are often done in batches as well. Um, many batch plants make more than one product, okay? So if you're in, a po in the polymer industry, for example, you typically make more than one type of polymer because you have more than one type of customer. The customer tells you what they want and then you have to make the batches and give them to, you, to them. So you use the same equipment for different polymers, okay? So that's multi-product. Uh, so batch control is fundamentally different than what we talked about. First of all, there's no, st there's no sense of a steady state, right? So the idea that, you know, we have a set point. What does set point mean? It means something totally different. Um, and the processes operate over a wide range of um, conditions, right? So we, we like to think, like the whole class I've taught you is based on uh, assuming the process is linear, right? If you didn't know this already. Because everything we do is based on Laplace transform <coughs> and transfer functions. That's only true if it's linear. The chance of a process being linear, behaving linearly, is greatly increased if it operates in a small window. Because even if it's nonlinear, you won't see it too much. Okay? Like you guys, I guess you had this experiment in the um, lab, right? And you, you did this in freshman chemistry, and you may have even done it in high school. Remember that old titration curve, right? So you got pH, right? And you, you and then depending if you have any buffering, you, you know, you get that has some buffer. You get something that looks like that, right? This is like the amount of base you added versus pH. Remember this, doing titration? So, you know, if you're, if you're in some range like here, you can maybe think, you know, it's kind of linear there. It's not too bad. But if you operate over this whole range, sometimes base has no effect, and sometimes it has an enormous effect. So this is not linear. And that's going to be much more difficult to control and model for that standpoint. But you know, in batch processes, this is the kind of thing that happens because you operate over a wide range of conditions from startup to shutdown, and the chances of the nonlinearity causing you a problem is much, much greater. All right, I already talked about run, run to run control. Oh, sorry. Well, I already talked about this. So basically, the idea of batch process control <coughs> to a large degree is just about sequencing of different steps um, to run the batch. Run to run control, the idea is improve the next run from what you learn from this run, and then. Um, I'll talk about scheduling and planning. So this is something you guys don't get any exposure to. I'm sure they do a lot of this in mechanical engineering, and maybe it's mainly mechanical engineering types that do this. But, you know, in a plant, you, you know, scheduling is like when you're going to make different products. 
This is like a huge deal in refining, right? Which isn't batch, but whatever. Um, because you understand how a refinery works, right? They make lots of different products and they make whatever products make the most money. And so you have to schedule how you're going to run things. Um, and so, and planning is even slightly different. So if you've got six plants that make products for 53 customers, how do you schedule all those and plan the use of all those plants to, to, to produce products for all those customers at minimal cost or something like this? So these are more on the, what we call enterprise level, okay? Um, you know, corporation level, let's say. And so we tend not to focus on them, but it would be nice if you had some exposure to these. And it used to be we had a two-part design sequence instead of a one-part, which you may be like, well, I'm glad that's not the case, but whatever. Um, and in the second part, you know, we had a chance to cover these kind of things, but we don't really have time now. So I'll talk about it a little bit. Okay. Have you ever seen this? This may seem weird to you. The first time I saw this, I thought this is the weirdest thing ever, right? Batch distillation. It, it's contrary to my whole idea of why you should do distillation, right? Batch distillation. All right. This is not that uncommon though. So instead of um, having a, a, you know, a continuous system where you're putting vapor up the column and liquid back down the column, you have a batch distillation unit. So of course you have to apply steam. You start with liquid here, you understand? The way this works is you, you um, charge this with a bunch, bunch of liquid that you want to separate. Let's say it's a binary mixture. It's got a more volatile component, less volatile component, right? You're going to boil this up. You're going to allow there be reflux so you can get some better separation. Then you're going to collect the product. Obviously, if you boil all the liquid, you haven't achieved much. <laughs> because you'll just put it up in this drum and it'll be the same composition. So at some point, you're going to stop. Right? You're going to run this thing for a while. And then you're going to collect part of the liquid up here. It's going to be enriched in the, in the more volatile component. Some's going to be left and it's going to be enriched in the less volatile component. Okay? Um, and that's shown over here. So this is the composition. So this looks like this is an example of ethanol and water, where ethanol is the more volatile component. And so you can see that. Um, so this is just the composition. Obviously, another thing is how much material is there, which isn't shown here. But when you start boiling, you know, you get a lot of ethanol up there. But if you run too long, then obviously you won't, you'll be getting a lot of water up there. So, but this is, so this is fundamentally different than the way you do continuous distillation, right? Um, and you might imagine that um, this is going to be a fundamentally different problem for doing things like control, okay? So in principle, the controls that you have available, things you can manipulate, things that you might want to control are, are similar. But, you know, the idea, there's no, not going to be any steady state here, right? This, this, is get, this liquid's going to tend to get, I mean, not tend, it's going to get more hotter and hotter as you apply more, more heat to it. Okay, and there's not going to be any kind of steady state here. All right. Um, so this is kind of an overview of how batch control systems work. So we have um, equipment that we want to run. So what is equipment? Reactors, separation units, heat exchangers, whatever it might be. Um, and we're going to use these to run batches. So we're going to we're going to have something called sequential control. So that means if we want to run a reactor. We're going to have a series of steps we use. This is the same kind of thing you do in a continuous process when you start up. Like, let's say you want to start up a plant, okay, even if it's continuous. You, ha you have to have a sequence of steps that the operations people do to, to start the plant. You can't just, like, arbitrarily start it up, like, any way you want, right? There's a set of, um, there's a recipe, basically. Do this, do this, do this, do this, okay?